Welcome to our session. Um, I want to start the whole presentation with a little bit of a kind of thought exercise. I want to give you a little bit of a task that kind of you can keep thinking for a little while. And I want you to imagine that you'll have to build a system that will be um, counting number of people. I don't know, say you have it outside this room and you want to measure how many people are going in and out of the room. And I want you, you can use whatever you want of hardware, software, whatever. Uh, and, but I, I really want your system to comply with four simple rules. So it has to be quite strict privacy policy, so I don't want the names uh, or, or, well, identities or faces or whatever of people going in and out of the room to be leaked anywhere. I want it to perform really well, so it doesn't matter if it is just one person or if it is um, 100 people just passing uh, in front of a sensor, a camera, whatever that would be. Um, I want it to be quick, so if anything happens, I want to know that pr pretty fast. And I want it to be relatively cheap to run. So kind of four simple rules. Um, think about that for now. And while you're doing that, I think we're going to spend a few minutes uh, telling a few words about ourselves. Yeah, hi. My name is Tannas. I'm working for the University of Oslo, where we are building an open source cloud infrastructure based on OpenStack for research and education sector in Norway. In my spare time, I'm helping IT communities and well, working with IT devices. Yeah, and my name is Rustam. I work uh, in a company called Computas, also in Oslo, Norway. Um, I, um, I am a Java champion and a Google developer expert for cloud. I'm also running a few communities uh, in, in Oslo. One of them is a, a cloud developer community. So. Um, the thing we're going to talk about is a kind of uh, a pet project that we had. And, uh, well, let's go back to our example. Yeah, because I think we can solve that problem with IoT devices. IoT devices are cool, easy to set up, accessible, and the number of these devices is just growing so fast. So maybe one of those devices can solve our problem. Yeah. And that was actually exactly our thought. Uh, we first thought. Uh, we thought about that and was like, huh, that, that's, that, that's probably a good start. And well, let's see how it got, where it got us. Um, before we do that, I um, should kind of show you the stack, or the, it's also the, the plan for, for the, the, the talk today. So what you have in the bottom would be general IoT devices, those devices that's usually being sold to you as smart devices, but you know, they're kind of a bit bunch of sensors and a bit of network connectivity kind of devices. They're not really smart because somebody else, some cloud or something is being smart on their behalf. But well, IoT devices. So then you have IoT edge devices on top of that that have a little bit more power and things like that. We'll explain what they have. And on top of that, there will be two more things that uh, kind of connect them all together. It's a fog and a cloud. We'll explain all of those things in a little bit. Um, since we're, well, you might have guessed that uh, most of the time we'll be spending on, on this talk uh, about on, on, on IoT edge. So we decided to split that part up also in three different parts. So we're gonna be looking at uh, different devices that we had to look at. We did uh, some software, hardware, and architecture of those devices. So that will be um, our plan for today. But then let's start from the bottom, um, the IoT. Yeah, what's IoT in general? IoT devices, or the Internet of Things, we can say that it's the connection between our world and the digital world. These devices have internet connectivity. They generate and collect massive am amounts of data and send those data over the network to some servers or cloud for processing and then receive the results. That's great, but there are some challenges as well because as the internet connectivity is growing and mobile technology is improving so quickly, our lives become more and more dependent on such devices. And as these devices are just Sorry. growing so fast, uh, privacy concerns and security issues, it can be a thing because they will affect our lives. However, overall, we can say that the growth of IT devices are great because they give more access and opportunity to more people. And since we're talking about IT devices growing so fast, uh, it's kind of always nice to show some kind of, well, a graph. Um, I, I really like this, this one because it, it's not just showing, well, the devices are growing. We've seen those graphs before. But this one is actually kind of comparing it to the other things. So 
uh, the funny thing is that the, the blue, the, the dark blue thing on the bottom that is slightly declining is actually computers, PCs, or well, Macs, whatever. Uh, but um, well, then you have smartphones and smart TVs and smart home devices and all the other things. But nothing is really growing as fast as this gray thing in the back there that is a general IoT device or those IoT internet connected uh, devices. And this is kind of cool. And well, those devices are really nice and they obviously have some good, I mean, there is a reason for why they're, the, the number is growing so fast. And th some of those devices, some of those reasons for those devices are the uh, things that they're very specialized to do what they're supposed to do. So they're just very good at doing this little thing that they're supposed to do, measuring temperature, uh, accelerometers, GPSs, whatever. And they're being produced in so many numbers, so the, it's getting cheaper and easier to produce them, so they're kind of smaller and also getting smaller in the size, but also in uh, the prices are getting lower, and uh, they're quite efficient at what they're doing, obviously. And um, they also very often come with some kind of tracking uh, abilities. So they would have like a GPSs, accelerometers, whatever, compasses, it's all those kind of things. Well, that's kind of a good thing, right? But not everything is good. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, security can be a challenge because now we have much more devices that, work, that want to interact and communicate with each other. We have more software and hardware that can have potential bugs. So it makes it more complex. Privacy can also be an issue because in most of the cases, we send raw data over the network to some servers, and both servers and network can leak data. Uh, as we are talking about lots of hardware devices, environment can be an issue because, yeah, we are just making so many devices, so we have to think how we can recycle them. Uh, well, these devices are dependent on the internet. In most of the cases, if we don't have internet connectivity, we cannot use them. Well, so. The next thing in our stack is IoT Edge. If you want to explain a few words so we can say that edge computing improves operation and cut, cost, cuts costs. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we need to have a definition for edge computing, first of all. As IDC says, edge computing is a mesh network of micro data centers that process or store critical data locally and push it to a central data center or cloud. Well, edge computing collects the data that are produced by IoT devices and to get processed on the device locally. So uh, IoT computing send almost all the data somewhere else for processing, while edge computing keeps most of the data on the device and do most of the processing locally. It means that such devices have their own compute, storage, and network on the device just in a smaller factor. And I really, before we go any further, I really want you to uh, just hold on to one thought. And that thought is this thing that says there are a mesh network of micro data centers. Just hold on to that thought. We'll get back to that in a second. Just, yeah, that's it. Next. Um, well, obviously, those devices uh, have some uh, good p positive sides again because they're kind of trying to address some of the issues that we've seen with just the general IoT devices. But, well, you know, um, they, they provide low latency so because they don't have to ship that much data over the network. And sometimes you don't really even able to ship that much data over the network because you might be having a, um, uh, sensors on, uh, say, a boat that is somewhere in the middle of the ocean, and you don't really have a, anything else than just a tiny little satellite link. And uh, you cannot send gigabyte of, gigabytes of data. So uh, you, you, you cannot send all that data. So, so then it will provide you low latency because, well, you don't sell, send it, you process it locally, most of it. Uh, if and only if you implement it correctly, it will also help you with the privacy issues because you won't be sending the kind of the sensitive data over the network. Uh, it will give you a nearly real-time availability, data transmission, and things like that because, well, again, you don't send data that much uh, anywhere. And in general, it will give you some kind of productivity increase because, well, you process things, you don't have, you don't have to rely on somebody else on the other end being, doing the processing and telling you what to do and all those kind of things. Well, but yeah, uh, <laughs> when we are talking about edge computing, in almost like every time we are talking about them, it, we are talking about one device. It means that there is no redundancy. So if we lose our device, we lose our data. Or if our device fails, so we have to replace it. But if something like this happens in the cloud, we can just start a new virtual machine and it works well. 
And when it comes to security, there are two different arguments. On one side, we can say that edge computing is more secure because there is less data in communication with third parties, and that's great. But on the other side, we can say that it's less secure because the device itself can get attacked much more easier. So in designing such devices, we need to think about the access control using a VPN, and uh, well, we have to remember to patch and update our devices regularly. And well, going back to this idea of IoT devices versus IoT edge devices, and most of the devices you would normally have at home would be a, a kind of IoT devices. Even the, the home assistants of any kind that you might have at home usually would be some kind of well, in a most in a kind of most common sense, would be an IoT device because uh, they would record what you tell them, but they won't be processing much of it. They will actually send most of it over to the to to. to to serve it somewhere and 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 uh, re return the intent, uh, or if they even don't do that, they will still send the data over to somewhere to the cloud. Because well, we've seen the issues with pretty much all of them were in the newspapers last few months with different issues of the voices and 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 and, and everything being leaked somewhere or ending up in a kind of different place than it was supposed to be. And also when you have a smart lights or things like that at home, you will end up with using a uh, kind of solution that's been already made for you. And then you end up pulling up your phone, opening an app, clicking in a button, and then it would typically go to some kind of bridge, to some kind of gateway, possibly send some stuff to the cloud, go back and all the way, and then turn on the lights or change the color of the lights or whatever that would be. And it's happened so fast that you don't really think about it. But I mean, wouldn't it be nice that you can just provide all that kind of functionality with a little bit more processing power, but just locally on your device? Because, well, um, the problem is that when you have those devices listening in and all these kind of things, things like that happened. Just give you a few seconds. <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> It's, it's a little bit sad, but you know this is the reality we live in. And well, I mean, there is also obviously ways to counteract that, of course. And uh, this is the uh, the ultimate solution. So um, you know, <laughs> when you when you come to home to come coming home to anyone, just you know say Alexa, Siri, and all the other ones, and see if they're actually listening. Uh, but, well, okay, let's go back. But the thing is that you don't really have, uh, sometimes you don't really want to send all that data over. And, well, there might be several reasons for that, right? Yeah, I think that these devices are really helpful. But the problem is that the combination of, like, they're collecting information from several resources and then combine all those and send it, like combine it with a specific person, time, and location, and share that information with other companies. That's the problem. So it would be much more better if they could process all those functionality on the device to protect data and prepare uh, privacy. All right. So uh, two more things that we need to mention. Um, a fog. How many of you have heard of fog? <laughs> nice, very nice, very nice. This, uh, for the record, the, the, they were like, I don't know, five, five, six, six, seven hands, I think. And for the record, this is the all-time high we have, I've seen it while doing this presentation. Uh, usually, it's just two hands. Uh, and usually, well, cloud, anyone? Your hands are working? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th that's the, usually a check, because most of you have heard of cloud, but not very many have, uh, have heard of fog. And well, some have different kind of definitions of that as well. But um, so what is actually a fog or, an, or fog computing? So um, a very kind of roughly and simplified version of that, that fog would be anything that you see there with the background, a blue background or any other color that, you know. Uh, but well, blue uh, or background in general. Um, so it's, it's, it's a thing that connects all the IoT de uh, devices together. Remember I asked you to, to, to kind of hold on to this thought of a mesh of micro data centers. So that's the, that's the kind of thing that connects them all. And that's also the thing that connects it to the cloud or to some kind of um, uh, data center or whatever that would be. So. Just to sum up these terms, edge computing can be any devices, such as wearable devices, home assistant, 
network sensor systems and so on. Mm. While fog computing is then network that is needed to transfer data from the device to its final destination. And well, cloud, which is someone else's computer. <laughs> Yeah, so now uh, that we have all the bits and pieces together, let's have a look at what we, uh, the, what we had to uh, go through to, to, to select uh, the software, the hardware, and the architecture for those devices that we wanted to use for this pet project of ours. Um, to do that, we need to go back to our, uh, this thought experiment that we started with. So you had to build a system that would be counting number of people, typically with a camera or whatever, and um, we need to comply to privacy concerns that we have. We need to have a good performance, a low latency, and low cost. Mm -hmm. All right. So, yeah, to devices. Do that, we needed to find a hardware for that. Most of the public cloud providers have already thought about that. So both Microsoft and Google have a hardware for that, while AWS has an operating system. And there are some other alternatives which are more general, such as Raspberry Pi, Banana Pi, and Arduino. But there are some devices that have like something extra for running machine learning on them. Uh, talking about machine learning, so edge computing compared to the cloud has a limited resources. To bridge the gap between edge computing and the cloud, there are some companies that have uh, built some devices with purpose-built accelerators that have a tiny chip and the things that that chip does is to take over the most complex and expensive part of the calculation that will speed up the process. And it will free the CPU so we can use the CPU for every other things. Uh, and yeah, that is what's great yeah. with these devices. And those devices uh, are pretty good because, well, you know, they have, they have a little bit extra. So you still have a tiny little hardware. I mean, Raspberry Pi, it's not po super powerful, is it? Uh, but then it will still give you a bit of more extra stuff. And uh, there are a few devices, and the few that we had to look uh, at um, is um, NVIDIA Jetson. Uh, it's a tiny little uh, machine, like a, 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 a Raspberry Pi size kind of thing, uh, with its own operating system, with extra hardware that it brings and everything. And, and um, well, it, it can do neural networks. It can do AI kind of stuff. So you can, whenever you run that, you would run it on a separate chip that would um, offload the CPU for you. Uh, then you have a USB kind of sticks, uh, USB accelerators. That's the one, um, the, the, the one you have there, the Intel chip. It's a uh, thing like that. It looks like a USB uh, stick I had, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago with 16 megs or something. But it's kind of the big fa factor, but it's actually a pretty cool thing because it's, it's, it's able to uh, process everything on any computer. You just plug it into that computer and it will do that. And then there is a Google Edge TPU thing that is, uh, comes also in two flavors. There is one that is a similar thing um, with a USB, accel uh, USB accelerator, so just plug and play kind of thing. And then there is another that is a, a separate box. Um, the, the separate box thing with own operating system and everything like NVIDIA Jetson, it looks kind of like this. And well, we have it live here as well. You can have a look at that later. It's kind of a bunch of cables and everything, so hard to move. Um, <clears throat> but you have a better picture there. Um, so the thing is, the hardware is pretty much as a Raspberry Pi. But the thing is that most of the magic happens on this little board that you see under the cooling um, and the fan and everything. That's where the CPU is and uh, TPU and all this uh, AI kind of uh, stuff is. And the thing on the bottom is just kind of convenience so to connect network, to connect cameras, to connect uh, USB, and, you know, things like that. Um, and TPU, speaking of TPUs, um, you might have heard about TPUs before. No? TPUs, anyone? Going once, twice? Okay, a few hands. So the TPUs you've heard of probably a little bit different kind of TPUs because this one is a tiny little thing. So this is the chip compared to a, a penny. Uh, and um, still, it provides pretty nice uh, performance boost. Uh, we'll see an example of that. But the TPUs you might have heard of, it looked kind of like this. Um, a little bit bigger, tiny little bit. And that's not actually the whole thing. I mean, I think the whole setup, I'm not sure, I don't remember exactly, but the whole setup. This is a picture I took at Google Cloud Next in San Francisco the last last one in, in, in May or so. Um, 
But uh, the thing is, uh, so the, the whole setup is actually to have like to six or eight of them in a, in a row, and that would be like the cluster. So bit different performance, but still, uh, t compared to the size, compared to the power, compared to everything, they, it's a different kind of story to, to a regular tiny little CPU that you'll find in IoT devices. Anyway, um, going back to our example. Yeah, now that we know how, which hardware we chose to use, we can go back and see how we implement our experiment. Uh, we decided to use machine learning because in our case we have lots of data, it should be quick, and as we have like lots of data, it is more complex to do it with a simple script. Um, well, to uh, do that, we had to understand some uh, terms in machine learning, such as classification, detection, and tracking. Uh, classification is when we know what kind of object we are talking about. In detection, we know what kind of object we have and where it is on that image, so we know the coordinate of that object. And in tracking, uh, which is quite a like, like detection, but in tracking we have a series of images, so we have to do the both classification and detection for each uh, image in that story. So just to explain a little bit better, in Poppy's language, in classification we know that we have puppies and not kitties, in detection we know where our puppy is sitting, and in tracking we know where it is moving. But before we explain how tracking works, because this tracking is a little bit more complex, we can show you some examples of classification and detection. Yes, we can show you an example, and we did a, um, a recording of that, but the, if we have some time at the end, it's, it's running on this machine, so we can show you this live as well. Uh, but for now, it's, uh, it's a recording that we need to play, play, press play. So what happens is that uh, we've created a simple, very simple web page uh, and, um, that would be running locally on this device that we see here. I don't know if I can lift that thing. Well, yeah, there's a lot of cables. That's the device. Um, so uh, it's, everything is running locally, uh, image processing and all those kind of things. And um, also the web server that kind of serves this thing. So if we... We start the server, oh, okay, again. We start the server and um, then we have a bunch of images that we just downloaded from the internet to use for this kind of uh, uh, example. Um, mostly animals, because they're fun. And obviously we had to implement this sausage not sausage app thing from, I don't know if you've seen the, the series, they have this super revol revolutionary AI app. So we did that as well. Um, and then we can do two things. So we do classification. Uh, so this is actually classifying that, well, this is a pug. Uh, and, uh, and also shows us the certainty of uh, how, how, how certain it is about it being pug. Uh, but then we can also do detection. And the funny part and the interesting part is that there is using two different models. So one of the models knows actually what the person concept is and the other one doesn't. So in, in, in some of the uh, examples, it will actually recognize a person and in some others it won't. And the quality of the things it recognizes or things it's trained to recognize is also different. So because, for example, here we actually know that it's four hot dogs. But for example, for this one, uh, for koala, it will say, well, it's a koala because we're doing classification. But if we're doing detection on the same thing, that one is not trained to recognize koalas. So surprise, surprise, it will tell you that it is a dog. Well, it kind of looks like a dog, right? Weird dog. Uh, <clears throat> Australian dog. Um, everything tries to kill you in Australia, isn't it? Uh, well, anyway. Um, <laughs> and then you have also hairy dogs. Uh, it actually recognizes that it's a dog. It's impressive. Well, anyway, OK, <laughs> enough with fun. Um, let's go back to the thing. So um, now we have that we know that the classification and detection, and we have all that in place. Um, we need to look at how we do we do that with the video because uh, images they're fine. I mean it's okay, uh, but it's it's not very. You don't have to do that many times a second or whatever. And the reason uh, video is a bit hard is that well, video ever since uh, uh, this guy called Edward Maybridge in the late 1800s created the whole animation concept where he realized that oh I can take lots of pictures, I can switch them really fast, and our brains will think that things are moving. 
And it's been like that ever since. So the only the thing that changes the number of uh, images that changes a second, and also the quality of the images. So this is one of these first animations. You might have seen that thing. It usually is in our rotating kind of thing that goes really fast, and well, you can see the horse uh, running. So the moral of this story is that video is just a bunch of images, lots of images. Uh, and to process all of those images, you need to do uh, classification, detection, all those kind of things to hopefully each frame, maybe not maybe every 10th frame or whatever, but quite often. And then um, to do that it, with a CPU, it's gonna be very, very, um, uh, pow uh, you will need a powerful CPU because it will be quite uh, heavy on the CPU and then you will have much bigger hardware and then you will need to have a huge machine being outside this room and filming and trying to process all those kind of things. With AI, with machine learning and this kind of things, those things are very optimized and they really go really fast. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed this uh, example we had with the dogs and everything. It would show you the time it used to detect and it was just a few milliseconds. Um, and then you have to do, when you have all that in place, now you have to do tracking because there is an, I'll explain in a second why, but the thing is that uh, when, when you do tracking, it will also demand a lot of CPU power. And the reason for that is, uh, oh, it's the wrong computer, okay. Um, the reason for that is, so say you have a 10 seconds of video and you're filming at 30 frames per second. Just for, for calculation's sake, it's easier to multiply 10 by 30 and then you'll be sitting there with 300 frames, right? And then you have two people in the frame. If I ask any of you here in your room to kind of realize, uh, to count the number of people within those 10 seconds, you will do it like this, without thinking. Um, computer doesn't know that. Computer has no idea if it is like 600 people on that thing, because, well, 300 frames times two people, or it's actually two, uh, if you just do detection. So you have to do something smart. You have to send it over to some kind of um, uh, comparison thing. Um, and also, uh, the people will be moving, and if the third person appears, it should, it should give it another ID to, to, the, to the third person and keep the IDs of two other people uh, on, 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 uh, on the video. And all of that has to happen a lot, uh, many, many, many times a second. Yeah, these are like our four main steps that we do for each image. We start with capturing a, uh, an image from our camera and then we do resizing because our machine learning models use a specific size of images then we run processing on those images, and then we, when we have the result, we display it. And we do all those steps for each frame. So here is the system in action, so we can see how accurate it is actually. Like, Rustam and I are more human than the picture on Rustam's access card. And we can say that it uh, takes like 120 frames per second. So the inference time is eight milliseconds. It means that it goes through all those four main steps just in a few milliseconds for each image. And now we have 120. Yeah. So that's quite fast. And the point is, I mean, that it's not really a device specific thing. I mean, if you find another device that can do AI processing on, on board, you'll probably get similar or kind of the, the, the results like that. So we're not really talking about the devices. The whole idea is to talk about the whole concept of moving things that you don't have to uh, process on, on the cloud or on a big hardware to the small devices. Because if you would be streaming eight hours of video to the cloud, that might cost you quite a bit. If you do it or everything on this device, it will cost you the cost of the device plus the whatever energy that thing is uh, consumes. And that one does not consume much because now we're, I'm running actually that thing from a battery pack. So, you know, it could be like that. And, and another cool uh, video is the difference between, uh, let's see if we can do this. Uh, it's the difference between a CPU and TPU. So now we have, if we go back, because now it cached up, okay. so. Now it's uh, running on TPU, so it's doing the TensorFlow processing in this little chip. And now we switched back to T uh, CPU. So you can see it up there in the corner, it's saying CPU. So it's really, really, really laggy. We're down to two frames per second. And now we switched back to TPU again, and we're up to seven, uh, 70. So it's almost 10 times. And that's actually quite cool um, performance boost. Raspberry Pi, a kind of faster Raspberry Pi for the, almost the same cost. Um, okay, so next, um, full screen, no, 
Come on. Uh, it won't click. That's weird. Oh well. Um, we'll do it like this. Um, so um, the things that we learned. The things that we learned is that since we're doing many things, many operations a second, we need to optimize a lot. We need to optimize, 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 optimize all the time. Uh, the other thing that we learned is that different machine learning models will have different performance, and that will affect your uh, final thing, because uh, the model that we used in the beginning for, for, uh, for face recognition, uh, that had 120 frames per second. Uh, the one that we did later for person, uh, and we'll show you a demo, live demo of that thing in a second, um, uh, for the person, it had like around 70, 80 frames per second, so a little bit slower because it has to do some other things. Uh, the more models have to recognize, the more objects they have to recognize, they will be a little bit, maybe a little bit slower and things like that. And another thing that we learned also uh, the hard way, which is kind of a very obvious thing right now, and it's probably a very obvious thing to most of you, we did not think about that to begin with, is that you should not put, put much code in synchronous functions. And this thing that they teach you at school and uh, universities and everywhere is saying like, well, print f functions are really expensive. It's very true. I tried to print a, um, a NumPy arrays in, in debug console uh, just to see how things work. Um, it killed my performance from, it, it went down from, well, 120 frames per second to two. Uh, so don't do that. Um, we've done it so you don't have to. And well, again, optimize, optimize, and optimize. So the, probably the coolest slide of the slide deck is that where we have a Snapchat. That's a screenshot of Snapchat. It's written in Norwegian, but well, I'll translate that for you. It says, when you have one gig of memory and uh, you're creating 16 gigabyte of swap so you can compile stuff. Uh, and that was the thing, because we tried to compile this little thing, a C library that was really, really big for, 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 uh, for, uh, for tracking, um, uh, for, for, for correlation of images. And that was not built for ARM uh, hardware, uh, ARM architecture, so we had to build it ourselves. It took us a few days to build it, um, so it's a bit hard. And you might wonder if it was actually a smooth sailing like this, because, well, another thing while it's so cool, the slide is super hip, is that we have emojis as well. Um, <clears throat> so smooth sailing, and in reality, it was a little bit more like this. Uh, a little bit cloudy, a little, not in a good sense. <laughs> a little bit wavy and a bit kind of thunderstormy. Um, then we were a bit like this. Uh, because, well, the thing is that the, 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 the thing is not working and it's not compiling and this is our pet project and we're spending nights and evenings banging our held, heads into the wall and knowing, not, having, having no idea how to make things work. Um, and then, you know, then you kind of, you learn things and you go back to smooth-ish sailing. Um, we learned quite a lot, and there is a lot of, I mean, we've had this thing almost, we got this thing almost uh, the moment it got uh, available. Uh, it was in beta for a very, very long time. It got out of beta in, for, in October or something, November, October. Um, so uh, a lot of things changed. So it's not only us that learned, but it also that thing got better. No, um, I should mention that it's much more, like compared to other devices that we tried earlier, it was yeah. like, much more easier to get started with, so. This one um, had a, quite a lot of issues. First thing, the requirement was, when I got this, less than a year ago, it was in 2019, I got this thing, first of the requirements was, install Ubuntu 16.04. And I was like, um, thank you. Uh, so yeah, and that was a lot of uh, pain. And well, I think that got a little bit be better afterwards, but now that kind of the ship has sailed, if we're using the smooth sailing uh, analogy. Uh, but well, so we're, we're using another device. But um, it's, it's, it was quite fun. So, um, demo time. Should we do some demos? We can try to do some demos. We can try demos. to do some demos. So I think uh, we're going to do another thing that you're not supposed to do. We're going to switch computers in between. We're going to switch between two computers in, while doing a presentation. That's a very dangerous move. Don't do that. Again, we're going to do that for you so you don't have to. OK. 
kind of stretching our luck with demo guts, but <laughs> black screen is a good sign. OK, there you go. Um, Yeah, we'll mirror displays. Here you go. No. Um, displays. Mirror. Apply. Keep configuration. Yay. OK, so now we have the, let's see if we're running. Yes, we're running. So now this, this is the first demo. And this is the cool thing, because uh, just remember that classification has no, no concept of human. It has nothing, it doesn't, it doesn't understand that. While detection has the uh, idea of what a human or a person would look like. So um, classification would just return you things like uh, this. We can zoom in a bit. So it will say, well, it's a hot dog, and well, I'm pretty certain, 99% certain it's, it is a hot dog, and things like that. Uh, so if we do something with a person, a classification, um, it will tell you, well, I know it's a chihuahua. And that's right, because there is a chihuahua on a picture, but it has no idea that the person is there as well. So it would ignore that. So again, that's another thing, that the different models that you'll use, you, can, uh, you, can, you, you should use the ones that are trained for what you want to use it for, or you can train your own. We were, uh, last year, before Easter time, uh, we, were, we got this thing uh, shipped to us just before Easter. So we actually trained this thing to recognize uh, Easter bunnies, eggs, and chicken uh, just by downloading and scraping the internet for 20, 30 images of bunnies, chicken, and eggs, uh, 30 each, ish, uh, training that thing on the device. And it would actually recognize those pretty well. So you can actually train your own models. Um, another cool thing is that if we do the same thing with detection, it will actually know that the person, uh, where the person is and where the dog is, so they will have the orange boxes around it. Another fun thing is that, uh, for instance, if you do classification of uh, this image, that's actually quite fun, this image in the middle there uh, of a lady with a, with a band, a stretching bandy thing, uh, if we do detection, it will know that it's a person, I guess. Come on. Yeah, there you go. So it's a person, and we're pretty sure it is 98%. Um, but if we do classification, and it has no idea what the, uh, what the person concept is, can you guess what it will actually say? Do you, know, do you recognize the pose? Um, I'll, 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 I'll show you in a second. Dumbbells. Because it has seen a lot of people, images of people sitting there and doing the push, uh, the, the shoulder press, right? So it actually re recognized that, well, this is probably kind of the things I've seen with dumbbells. So it's, it was kind of a funny thing. Um, yeah. Uh, let's show the live video. Um, OK, so now we have another demo. Uh, of actually the, the thing we were building. So we have a video uh, processing live and counting number of objects. It worked with a very variable uh, success rate towards the public because usually there would be a lot of lights coming towards, um, uh, coming towards uh, the camera. But in this case, I think it might actually work pretty well. So now we're starting a model. The thing that we've built, uh, we can make it bigger, yes. Uh, come on. Is it big enough? Yeah. Um, so now we're running a model, this uh, script that we've built. So it kind of starts a server in the background there. Um, uh, we're providing a model to, to, to use for, for the processing. We're providing also the threshold. So we, want, we don't want to see anything on below 80% certainty that it's a person. And we also, well, we are filtering only persons, so we don't want to see anything else that it finds or might find. And we're also printing the coordinates of uh, that uh, object. So we need to refresh. Hey, it works. Wow. OK. So one person. Hey. One object, two objects. OK, so it works. Now we're going to do the scary part. 
turning it over to the camera. Say hi. hi. How many people do you see? None? None, actually. <laughs> Zero objects. <laughs> you're not human enough. You're b I have some bad news for you people. Um, maybe we should get closer. Maybe. maybe we should get closer. Can we? Oh, yeah, we can. Uh, no, we can't. We're going to kill the, the power, uh, the, the screen thing. Well, we can try. We can try. How are we doing? No? Still nothing? Huh. Okay, <laughs> we have some bad news for you. Our, our machine learning and artificial intelligence supercomputer decided that, um, well. <laughs> yeah, it See? works like here. It works in my machine. <laughs> yeah, it needs some more optimizations and stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's a pet project. And the, the whole idea of this project was actually not to create a super surveillance system. It was actually to play around with all these kind of concepts and see how is it to, to now the fan is working because it got really hot processing all the videos. But the cool thing actually is that we're doing 73 frames per second. So 10 milliseconds uh, uh, to, to, to process all that and to try to recognize if there is a people on that or not. And um, the whole idea was to actually to play around with this technology and see how far we can get with that and things we can do with it. And you can also, uh, for example, teach that thing on the fly to recognize objects by like pushing, a, connecting a button or something and pushing a button and saying, well, this is a water bottle and then it will recognize the water bottle after a few uh, tries. And it's kind of cool. Um, time for questions. Any questions? Ah, yes, we should do that. That's a good point. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you're less human now, if it works. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> it's a better news, right? It's better than nothing. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, very bad joke. Um, okay, I'm still working. Oh, the other way around. How are we doing? Oh, 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 we have one. Okay, who is 60% human? Hey, we have one. <laughs> so we need to lower it again. <laughs> this is actually fun. Um, <laughs> this is supposed to be kind of build you up, not break you down. <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> some good news, some bad news, you know. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks for the tip. I didn't think about that. <laughs> you kind of stand here on the stage and it doesn't work, and you're like, mm. oh well. Any questions? Any thoughts? Any comments? Anything? Here you go. What's the cost? Oh, the cost of this thing. Um, the moment we got it, it was, I think it's the same, uh, it was around 150 bucks for the, the board and 50 for the camera, so 200 bucks in total, uh, plus uh, chargers and stuff like that. I mean, you need some power and you need some cables, but, you know, that things you have at home. Because, like, for example, this thing right now, it's running on my battery pack, so, you know, it's... Um, things like that extra. Uh, and I think the, the, the other ones are pretty much the same. And then the USB accelerators will be actually much cheaper. This one is almost the same price as the whole board that when I got it. I got it the same moment, the moment they actually released those because it's the second version of that. Uh, but uh, then the USB accelerator for the Coral, this, this thing that is called Google Coral uh, dev board thingy, uh, that one is around 70 bucks, 75 or something. Um, I haven't tested that yet. The, the question is the performance difference between the USB accelerator and the dev board. I have not tested it, but I would expect it to be pretty much the same because the, th the, the, the difference is that actually 
all the board thing is for prototyping. So uh, technically it's a system on chip kind of thing that is on top of a bigger board that does all the kind of expansion ports and everything. So um, the USB accelerator would be pretty much the same, I would guess, but I, I'm about to order one. So I, I'll, I'll probably tell you in a, in, in a few Next weeks version. or months or something, maybe next version of, of this conference. Um, but um, we'll see how that works. I don't expect kind of the same thing. And I, if I'm, I might be wrong, but I think it has the same architecture actually as this thing. Uh, so it's some Nvidia's uh, chips made by Intel uh, that are in, in, in that thing. It used to be, I'm not sure if they changed, that's the thing. <sighs> yes, one there and one there afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so the question is like how that fits into the whole cloud thing because we did not really talk about the cloud. And actually uh, it is, uh, it's on purpose because the thing is that this thing right now is not connected to internet. It has a wireless uh, chip, but it's not connected to any Wi-Fi or anything kind of on purpose. So you can actually show the demos totally offline. But the idea was or is still is to create a, uh, to have a, a backend in the cloud that will collect only numbers of people passing. So you have an... Uh, an it's an, only the results. Yeah, so you just have only processed results. So you don't leak actually the, the, the faces or anything because it will just run the thing live and it will just throw it away because we're not storing anything. And it will just, the thing that you see in the corner there, uh, the number of objects that will be sent with, within some kind of time frame. So very simple backend for the cloud. But in general, you can use these things to uh, different kind of purposes. Because for example, uh, most of the, I don't know, things like parking, they go, uh, they're kind of more and more going to, towards this, uh, um, the concept of uh, reading the plates, number plates of the cars, instead of uh, all the other kind of cars and things like that. Uh, and to do that, usually they, they don't, they're not able to process all that in the car, in, in, the, uh, in the cloud. So they have to process it on local kind of edge devices and then send the data, just the text data over. The same goes with, for example, in Oslo we have this uh, uh, toll rings kind of uh, the, where you kind of, where, where you pay to drive through. And the same kind of uh, things happens there, like the first stage of processing also happens on, on the edge and then it's being sent over to the cloud. So the point is that you strip all the sensitive data from your thing and then you ship it to the cloud. If that answers yeah. the, yeah. There was one question in the back. Oh, so if it's going to co uh, count one person once or, or more than one uh, times, um, that's up to the implementation. So that's the detection part. So then what we're, what we're doing now, and we need to optimize it somehow, uh, is that you take the, uh, the square thing of a person. So for example, this thing that is in red square right now, you pick that image and you send it to a library. Uh, right now we're, we're, we've been playing around with something called Dlib that does the correlation between images. So it does send it between frames and then it will kind of have a look at if, do I think I've seen that object before or not? Um, but in general, if you just do a regular classification or, no, sorry, uh, detection, it will count them many times. So you have to do something on top of that. There are also uh, machine learning models for that as well. We have not looked uh, for, uh, at that. There is an experimental version also especially built for uh, Coral as well. Uh, made by Google Research uh, that we also have on the list to try, but that will probably come at some point later. They just opened, so I, I just talked to this guy who was on that team a few months ago, and they have uh, pushed it to public a bit later, just like a few weeks later after that. So uh, probably there will be some more cool stuff coming out uh, at that thing. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? There you go, there's one, yeah. Did you actually play a little bit with increasing the accuracy of your model, for example, using the validation test? I'm just curious. About we have not tried that yet. Um, we, um, but th th doesn't that um, imply that you have to, oh, so the question was if we have, 
uh, try to improve the accuracy of our model by having validation sets and stuff. But I, I, I think that implies also that you train your own model, yeah. right? So we did not do that for humans. It was a bit difficult to, because otherwise it will be just two of us running in front of the camera and then we'll be really good trained at us mm -hmm. and very bad at everybody else. So, uh, and then it's kind of really hard to find people. Well, we, we haven't looked at that, but it would be probably a good, um, good thing. And now, just I think a day ago or two, uh, it's been a huge release of data sets for uh, all kinds of things for machine learning. Uh, so that might be a very good idea to try. So now that we, it's easier to get hold of the data that is not sensitive or anything, it will be easier to, uh, to, to do that. They just released it, I think, I, I retweeted that like two days ago or something like that. So uh, yeah. But it's a very good point. I mean, we'll, we'll do that. I mean, for, for us, it was more kind of the fun and giggles kind of thing. So we were just playing around and see how far we can stretch that thing. But it was really good at chicken. Easter bunnies, chickens, perfect. Um, <clears throat> just with 30 images, not that much, really. Yeah, it was like 30, 35 images of each. And then it was actually, and then we just would give it an image that you haven't seen before. And would be, but then you do, uh, then you do uh, so, uh, what you actually do on this thing, which is very fast. You don't train the whole model from the bottom up. You do, you cut a few layers, a last layers. And then you rebuild them with this training thing. So you do kind of, you freeze the other layers and then you build the few last layers uh, on a model that is generally good at things. At like, uh, for example, uh, like for example, this one that has um, all these kind of objects. So it's much easier to train it to recognize another object than to recognize, I don't know, the bird sounds or something like that. Uh, so yeah, there is actually a model for this thing to recognize bird sounds and images of birds and things like that already. So you, um, th there was this project where they built a bird house feeding house that would make a funny sounds if it would not if it recognize anything else than a bird. So like for example, a squirrel. So it would kind of scare them away with a sound. And this thing was in a bird board, bird box. So it's a very expensive bird box, but yeah, yeah it's in a, it works. Any other questions? All right, then I think I'll say thank you for coming.